I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and today I'm speaking with Mr. Ethan Hawke, who plays the infamously the infamous ab abolitionist John Brown on Showtime's The Good Lord Bird, in addition to serving as the co-writer and executive producer of the limited series. Uh, first question I wanted to ask is, were you familiar with John Brown uh, prior to taking this project on? Not really. I, I, I felt so hard in love with this project that I almost can't remember my relationship to John Brown before it happened, you know? But I know that, you know, I feel like my dad had told me about Harper's Ferry and things like that, but, but growing up, my parents were split up. And so my mom was living in Vermont. When my first awareness of John Brown, my dad was living in Texas and my mom was living in Vermont. And so you'd hear very different stories about the Civil War you know, about what it was and what it wasn't. And uh, and in one environment, I would be told that John Brown was a lunatic, just a madman terrorist. In another place, you know, you'd be taught about what the abolitionist movement was and wh where he wasn't. But I, I certainly wasn't taught much, but I remember being hypnotized by the difference of what I was being told. And so I think that's why when I came across the book, I was so, I guess, moved, touched, in love with, uh, grateful for, is somebody making sense out of this moment in history? You know, when when the the tinderbox got lit, you know, the, when the fuse was set, so to speak. So um, as I said, as I said before, you also uh, you're, you're not just uh, in, involved with this as an actor, you're also involved as a writer and executive producer. Um, uh, what role were, uh, were you in when you first uh, came on board the project and how did you come to occupy the other two roles afterwards? Well, well the truth is that I remember, and it's very rare that this would happen. I remember the second I first heard of the book, I was on set doing Magnificent Seven. And uh, one of the camera operators said to me, you should play John Brown. And I said, what makes you say that? And he said, I'm just reading the best book. It's called The Good Lord Bird. And I remember thinking, what the hell is that title? That's a weird, what does that mean? And the guy said, well, it's when you see a bird, it's so beautiful, you, you say, good Lord. And I thought, all right, I'm gonna love that book. And so I bought it, I mean, I, I bought the book and as I read it, I was just laughing my ass off. And my wife kept saying, what are you laughing about? And I told her this book and she said, isn't that about John Brown? And I said, yeah, this guy, James McBride has done the impossible, which is, oh, you know, when talking about race in this country is so hard, it's so fraught, um, it's full of anger and fear and shame, guilt, uh, it's so difficult for us to have an honest dialogue about it. And so to have the story of John Brown told the way I might imagine Red Fox or Richard Pryor might tell you an abolitionist story. I was, it was a, just a new way to come at a very difficult topic, you know? And I really, I was, I just, it was that feeling where you're like, I just want to send this book to everybody I know for Christmas. I just want everyone to read it. And my wife was like, well, maybe we should make it a movie. And I said, ah, I can't be a movie. It's too big. It's too beautiful. And she's like, no, dummy. I mean, like a limited series. We like wake up to the era we're living in. I'm like, oh. And so when we met McBride to talk about it, I think I had come around when, I, when we first talked about it, I was like, well, I thought that I would play the oldest son or something. And my wife, was, again, was like, have you looked in the mirror recently? Like, you should play John Brown. I'm like, am I old enough to play John Brown? And sure enough, I was like, actually, I am. And uh, it's kind of like playing King Lear or something. You want to make sure you're still young enough to pull it off, but old enough to to understand the guy. And so I don't know, I guess I guess when we first met, I was already thinking like an actor, uh, but I didn't know when we, when the project first began, I just knew I wanted it to be. I, I, I wasn't sure what shape it was going to take. I was totally open to casting Jeff Bridges or I, I don't, I don't know. I, I was, 
And then slowly as we marched on, I came to see this as, you know, along with boyhood, one of the greatest opportunities of my career, you know, where to do something, you know, to use a sports analogy, it's an amazing at bat to get a chance. You know, you said you've been to Harper's Ferry. Well, when you stand there in Harper's Ferry, I can't believe that nobody would made a film about the Battle of Harper's Ferry before. I mean, it's an unbelievable dramatic moment in the United, history of the United States of America. I mean, we've had 19,000 Alamos, right? I mean, you can't, you can't flip through the channels without seeing a new movie about the Alamo, but you've never seen Harper's Ferry because it's still really dangerous. And telling the truth about that situation is still very volatile and upsetting to people is it makes them look at uh, the DNA of this country in ways that are really upsetting. Uh, and, and so, I don't know, I felt incredibly grateful to have this chance. And I just, I always saw myself as an actor. I just shucked and hustled and tried to make it happen. So I took on whatever role would help get it done. So it's interesting that you played this guy who is so driven by uh, his convictions that he's prepared to overthrow the government and that this aired right before the riots at the Capitol on January 6th. And I understand that these are very different things with one being driven by the injustice of, you know, the subjugation of an entire people and the others being driven by an untrue conspiracy. But, you know, in the aftermath of that, did playing this kind of character give you a perspective into what drives these people that you wouldn't have had prior? Definitely. Um, when you take somebody like this into your heart, you know, it's to stand in the shadow of a truly, whatever you think about him, it's, uh, you know, he was a very formidable human being who lived a life that, 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 that shook the country. And so to take on, to be his advocate, to stand in his shoes, uh, to be his lawyer, so to speak, to love him and see the world through his eyes was very exciting and, and powerful. What you're touching on is that, you know, history kind of decides who's a terrorist and who's a freedom fighter, right? I mean, George Washington, he loses that war, he's a terrorist. He wins the war, he's the founder of a country, right? Uh, we, could, we could go down through the list of freedom fighters. And for me, the difference is he was primarily a, a Christian. He was a Christian before he was an American, you know? And he, so he was willing to look at the ugly elements of the foundation of this country in a way that a lot of privileged white people were not willing to look at. He was willing to do something about his conviction. And, and that's very exciting, you know, to a person who has the courage of their convictions. What you're right about is it's also got to touch a megalomania. And megalomania is what takes over, you know, we could talk about bin Laden, we could talk about all kinds of people who start to think they're talking to God. It's a very, very dangerous conversation to have. Doesn't mean you're prepared. You might be able to talk to him, but it doesn't mean you're prepared to handle it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, going back to uh, something you were saying before, uh, when you were talking about um, reading the book and uh, laughing so hard uh, with the book, um, I'm guessing going into this uh, that you knew, is it, is it true that, you know, going into this, you knew that you wanted to transfer that humorous tone to uh, the limited series? That was everything. I mean, the, the spark of originality, you know, the spark of genius that lives in McBride's writing is his willingness to um, tease everybody. I had a great acting coach once, you know, when I was, younger who said, you know, if you really love something, you don't put it on a pedestal and worship it. You have to touch it and kiss it and hold it. And they were talking about Shakespeare that, you know, when you honor Shakespeare too much, it doesn't have any life. And sometimes when we honor history too much, it becomes like a library study. And 
something about really just diving in and seeing it from this unreliable narrator's point of view. Hen Henry Onion Shackelford is the key to the whole story because you don't know if he's telling you the truth. You don't know. I mean, it's just it's it's got a lot of Huck Finn in it, you know, and uh, and that clarity of a point of view freed it from the responsibility of history. You know, we had a bullshit artist at work in the center of our story, you know, and, and so he's spinning a yarn as he sees fit. And that allows you to actually get at some of the more human elements because you stop being so macro, government, world, equality, fairness, justice, what is it? God, faith, religion, how it intersects with government, all these big words and big important ideas. And you just talk about people. You, you get rid of all that and see so you start, it starts to be human and it starts to have love in it. And when that happens, I think hearts can open. One of the other things that I think is so interesting about how uh, you, you approach this as, as a writer is um, the, the, the way that the series looks at John Brown as this sanctimonious white guy, uh, 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 very, uh, at times trying to, you know, speak on, sometimes speaking on behalf of the black community and, you know, that, and that sort of, you know, thing about race. And um, I was just wondering, how did you go about, you know, capturing, uh, uh, capturing that uh, when you were writing well, this? So much of the work is done for me. You know, I mean, on one minute he's saying, you know, you know, he wants to free the Negro. And the next minute he accidentally kills this young man's, this young boy's father, and then doesn't even look close enough to see that it's a boy and gives him a dress and doesn't realize the young person is so afraid of him that he putting on the dress because he's worried he's gonna get killed. And that's, that's where McBride is so smart because when it first starts, you're like, oh, John Brown, we're gonna be talking about race in America. And then all of a sudden you throw this dress in it. And now all of a sudden you're talking about gender, wait, masculine, feminine. Then you realize, oh, we're in Kansas. We're neither North nor South. And, and so you you end up being able to talk about identity because you're it's beyond race. It's beyond masculine and feminine. It's who are we? You know, what is our essence? And you get into a real dialogue about identity, which is really much more interesting. So I know this is a bit of a general question, but what were some of your favorite scenes to film? Well, I can honestly tell you that I, the whole thing was so exciting to me. Uh, I've never, I've never felt a greater challenge. And uh, the the obvious ones that are really exciting to me, there's something about getting to play John Brown the night before he was hung. You know, that was the last scene of the series. First off, I came to really love Joshua you know, who was playing Onion and watching him grow up through the, you know, we kind of shot it in sequence. So I watched a young actor develop and watching, remembering who he had been five, six months earlier in his first scene and wait, where's my mark? What's this? Hey, what's happening? You know, he's just absorbing it all to somebody. Now he's finally dressed as a man, being able to play himself and he came in with his ideas and this confidence and this beauty that, that was very moving to me as an actor and as, as a friend of his. And also the history of what we were talking about. It's it, by that point in the story, I'm not just an old crazy white guy and he's not just like the token of the cause to me. We're friends, these characters love each other. They've gone beyond the superficiality of labels and they just have, an honest friendship and sort of have taken this guy who's so hyperbolized throughout the show and then getting to play those small moments. There's a grace to that scene, you know, that I, I found really moving. That and the actual raid, you know, the getting to play the raid at Harper's Ferry was, that was a moment where I couldn't believe that I was the first person to reenact this in a big real way. It, you know, it, it was, I couldn't, you know, Orson Welles never played this part because her plumber never played this part. How come Jason Robards didn't play this part? Paul Newman didn't play this part. Like, how did, 
how has this story not been told? And so th that was A, extremely exciting and B, felt like a huge, like you better not fuck this up, you know? So um, one other thing I was curious about is, you know, we've all had to find ways to amuse ourselves during this pandemic and uh, you, and you know, you're no stranger to that. So what was it like living in Seth Meyers' attic? <laughs> well, it was very hot, first of all. And um, he's not as good at his lines as people think. He redoes a lot of takes, gets super hot. No, uh, I happened to, was staying at a friend's house that lives right near him. So I actually saw him on a, I was running through Connecticut and I ran into him. He's like, come on over and be in the show. So I was. Well, I'm, I'm glad to at least know that you weren't like, you know, trapped there. Or he wasn't holding you hostage and something. No, I was there of my own free will. I'll admit it. <laughs> well, uh, Ethan, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best over this upcoming Emmy season. And to all of our viewers, please like this video, smash that subscribe button, and don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app to make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, Ethan. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.